Without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, our guest speaker. Um, Amy Brownlee is a journalist from way back. She used to work at uh, Cincinnati Magazine, where she was the digital editor. And we have an interesting connection with our speaker next week. Greg Hand was a contributor to um, Cincinnati Magazine, still is, I believe. Um, and so he'll be speaking next week. But they became friends and... Mom? Next month? Next month, yeah. Next, did I say next week? Yeah. Sorry, next month. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they uh, connected and Amy got connected to this national series called Lost in Enter Your City, which I think started in St. Louis, is that right? So um, she will be talking about some of our lost history and um, showing us some cool photographs. You know, as historical <laughs> preservationists and as a historical society, we all know that once something is lost, it's lost forever. And so it's our duty as historians to preserve that history and archive it and keep it in places that are safe for future generations. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Amy Brownlee. She went to Western Hills High School. Um, so I have a little bit of street cred in this room, but just a very little bit. <laughs> so, um, just a little bit about me. I, as Dan said, I worked at Cincinnati Magazine for about 11 years. Um, I, I finished as the digital editor. I started as the um, lifestyle editor. So I got to write about um, the consumer environment, travel, real estate. I got to tour some really great homes, um, and I got to write about history and. Um, we did history covers every year because Cincinnati is a town that loves its history and so it was a great audience for us and we, we would try to do a history cover every year or so and those were my favorite issues to work on because I would just I would get a slate of 20 or so assignments and I would just go out and do research about the city and park in the library for a couple weeks and it was just the most fun ever. So when I got an opportunity to do this book, I jumped on it and I found myself in the Cincinnati room at the downtown library, which if you haven't visited, it's a great way to spend an afternoon. It's on the second or third floor. You can go up there and just sit at the table and order up any yearbook you ever want to see from the city or any uh, Williams directory or various <coughs> phone books and things and just peruse. And I, I was kind of pinching myself. It was so much fun. Um, so one thing I want to start with, I'll just read to you a little bit of my introduction. And then I just want to take you through some of the entries that I picked out that I think are really um, just kind of the, the, the highlights of the book for me. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> and um, I can show you, I'm showing you some photos, some of which appear in the book, and then some of which um, don't appear in the book, which you just only get to see because you're here tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. Union Terminal is both a champion and a villain in this book. The iconic Art Deco train station stands today as a monument to preservation activism, civic teamwork, and a keen regional audience sustained over generations. It took time to get here, years of dithering and a slate of just terrible ideas, such as converting it to a shopping mall. Does anyone remember that one? Yes. <coughs> I'm really glad that didn't take. Before Union Terminal carved out a new role in the city's culture. Named a National Historic Landmark in 1977, the station is now host to the Cincinnati Museum Center, a conglomerate of five institutions. The Union Terminal's success story is a source of pride for Cincinnati. However, Union Terminal's construction left a huge footprint and is responsible for seven entries on this lost treasures list. The, construct the construction took out proximal structures and natural areas like Lincoln Park Baptist Church and the surrounding Lincoln Park, an oasis, an urban oasis with trees, grotto, and a lake that gave way to the station's fountain esplanade. The newly graded and spacious lawn was a fitting entrance to emphasize the scale of the building rising tall over Western Avenue, but it was a pale substitution for what it replaced. And eventually, as was the fate for far too many places in this book, much of its square footage was converted to surface parking, boom, though its scalloped stair-step fountain blessedly remains. 
Union Terminal's impact also reached throughout the city to dismantle a network of neighborhood passenger tra train stations, like Pennsylvania Station, Cincinnati Hamilton and Dayton Railway Station, Torrance Road Station, and Central Union Station. With all evidence to the contrary, Cincinnati is actually remarkably adept at preserving its history. Put it down to a love of local lore or to its sluggish evolution. For every item listed here, there is another place still standing, still striving, still on someone's list to save. The goal of this book is not only to bemoan what is lost to Cincinnati, though to be fair, that certainly is part of the project of reading it. It's hard not to follow these stories and see these images without feeling a sense of loss. It's harder still not to wonder how it would all look today if it had just been preserved or loved more or simply left alone. My hope is that local readers turn the last page with a sense of satisfaction that theirs is a city with a long textured history and above all, a city with far too many stories to be told in any single book. So I'll start with probably the most egregious entry on this list, the one that makes every room groan with pain. Does anybody recognize that? It's not the Albi. That is the original Cincinnati Old Main Library. The main branch of the Cincinnati Public Library of Cincinnati, I'm sorry, the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County is going strong with a brawny mid-century building stretching across two downtown blocks. But the original that it replaced was an unforgettable stunner from an altogether different age. Built in 1870 at 629 Vine Street downtown, the old main library had soaring cast iron book stacks, spiral staircases, and huge windows that bathed the checkerboard tile floor in natural light. But as post-war libraries looked to expand, the old main was too cramped, was deemed too cramped and run down for modern tastes. The building was raised in 1955 and replaced that later that year with its sprawling successor. <coughs> it, it is really hard to imagine. And, and, and they did just a complete about face stylistically with it. The new one is, it's lovely. Most of the images from this book are from our fabulous library system. Um, but it's really sad. <laughs> we don't have this downtown anymore. So going uptown ever so slightly, the Eden Park Reservoir, um, it's currently, you can still see the remnants, the ruins of this place. You can still drive right up to the bottom of it and see the archways and see truly what are literal ruins here in Cincinnati. Um, but it used to be a really important feature of our public waterwork system. In the 1860s, Cincinnati barely had enough water to get its nearly 200,000 residents through a single day. The city was in desperate need of a much larger and more reliable water reservoir. Completed in 1875 on the former site of Nicholas Longworth's failed Garden of Eden Catawba Wine Vineyard, the 14-acre Eden Park Reservoir increased the city's water storage capacity to 100 million gallons, up from around 20, 25 million. Though it was removed in the 1960s, the project spirit and many of its actual components remains. The station number 11 and standpipe, designed by Stanley Hannaford, stand in Eden Park, along with part of the original dam. Um, so I, I highly recommend if you're looking through Eden Park that you can actually see this, because it gives you a sense of the scale of it and what it must have looked like when it was, you know, before it was completely dismantled, let, let, allowed to fall into ruin. And moving on to um, an important feature on the, since the Ohio River, the steamboat. This was something that we think of now as kind of a novelty, but in early Cincinnati, two early Cincinnatians, it was a, a truly important part of the industrial culture here, and one of the reasons why Cincinnati is located where it is and it thrived where, where it landed. In the early 20th century, uh, Cincinnatians had more than a few options for getting around. Passenger train stations were in most neighborhoods. Inclines connected the basin with hilltop amenities. Flat bottom boats moved freight up and down the Miami and steamboats rolled along the Ohio River. There is perhaps no more romantic Ohio River character than the steamboat. The steam engine made river travel easier than ever before, 
and therefore river towns were much more accessible for living and working. Cargo and passenger-laden steamboats were a common sight on the river for most of the 19th century and well into the 20th century, with names like the Betsy Ann, the Island Queen, Golden Bell, Bell of Calhoun, and Valley Bell. Valley Bell. <laughs> with their glory days long gone, a few steamboats like Phoebe Riverboats are still in operation for pleasure cruises. But I think if you, if, if you ever attended a Tall Stacks event, um, you would maybe have some idea of what it was like to, to live here when steamboats were actually an industrial feature of the life here, when there would have been dozens of steamboats on the river at any given point. This gorgeous building it was located at the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, it was a band shell for, that fit an entire orchestra, orchestra. The former botanical gardens were the perfect setting for outdoor concerts in this ornate band shell. It was constructed in 1911 um, near today's Children's Zoo in Gibbon Island, and they hosted evening concerts there and social gatherings. Um, at home, among other remarkable structures, such as the 1875 Reptile House, mm -hmm. formerly the Monkey House, mm -hmm. and the 1906 Elephant House, Elephant House, formerly the Herbivera House, the band shell helped to make the Cincinnati Zoo one of the nation's loveliest. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a photo that um, it's slightly different from the one that appears in the book, so I wanted to give you kind of a different view. Okay, Palace of the Fans was a really nice idea, but it just didn't work. <laughs> it was an elaborately designed neoclassical grandstand. It was hand-carved wooden Corinthi column, Corinthian columns, which was a gutsy choice because its predecessor, League Park, had burned to the ground just a few years earlier, but they just went ahead and leaned into it. Another one um, it was the brainchild of Red's owner, John Brush. Um, however, it seemed outmoded even on its 1902 opening day. Its peers were the likes of Forbes Field and Kaminsky Park, which were these modern stone and steel um, stadiums. You don't, we don't associate that turn of the century, those turn of the century years with modernism, but this felt old fashioned to them already. Um, and it lasted just nine years before it was dismantled. After the last game of 1911, they waited about five minutes and then they took it apart and replaced it with Redland Field in time for the next season. So it's really lovely, but they were over it by the time this was built. One of my favorite entries in this book, and I wanted to include so many of these pictures, but my publisher only put in one, and it's like my least favorite one. Um, so I, and getting my way by showing you all of them tonight. Uh, the Stinton Hotel was, does anybody know why the Stinton Hotel is infamous in Cincinnati history? Am I the only one who knows this? Was it a Rebus connection? It wasn't, but it sure seems like it could have been based on what it's infamous for. Yes, that's it. So I was told this little factoid by a gentleman who gave me a tour like a Reds tour of Cincinnati, and he kind of walked me around and showed me various Reds adjacent sites. And he pointed to the corner of downtown where the Stinton Hotel was located, and he said that the journalist who broke the Reds White Sox uh, World Series fixing st scandal um, was staying in one room, and all the, the team managers and mobsters were staying in the adjacent room, and the dude had like, cup up against the wall, <laughs> listening to the whole deal go down, just writing it down and calling it, you know, calling his editor. Like that's, it's like a movie, but that's how it happened. But the Stinton Hotel is, like its prominent role in this historical moment in Cincinnati, I think is somehow like the, not the most exceptional thing about it. It was, it, it was one of those grand hotels and sort of entries on the list of grand um, travel destinations and the, Part of an era when travel used to be a really glamorous thing, at least that's how I think of it. If travel now is so uncivilized. Um, but it seemed like it was so pleasant, and um, the Stinton Hotel was kind of part of that culture. <clears throat> it was built in 1907 at the southeast corner of 5th, 4th, and Vine Streets, and it was spectacularly appointed with 450 guest rooms and then 300 added later, so it was massive for the time. Multiple dining and recreation options, including the Great Banquet Room, and a uh, ladies' dining room, a basement pub, a candy shop, a coffee shop, a convention hall, a billiard room. It was just like a city inside the hotel. In spite of all this 
luxury of the Stinton did become notorious when members of the Chicago White Sox and the Cincinnati Reds met there with gamblers to plan the fix of the century. In 1968, the hotel was torn down and replaced with the Provident Bank Tower, which is now called the National City Tower. So it's still, uh, you know, the, the building is, I think, still important. Like, it was replaced with another important building as far as Cincinnati architecture is concerned. But this one was just quite, like, really glorious. The Capitol Theater, oops, that's not <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm a little bit intimidated by the brewery culture here. When I talk about breweries, I get a lot of this, well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of mansplaining. It's a lot of that, you know, it's, 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 don't begrudge them that, it's, it's great. And I probably should have, I should have interviewed them for the book. Um, that would have solved everything. But I do know theaters. The Lyric Theater on the left-hand side and the Capitol Theater on the right-hand side are kind of two different, two generations of theaters, even though they both have those kind of fabulous street signs. The Lyric Theater was also known as the RKO Lyric. Um, it opened in 1906 for stage acts, converting to a movie theater in 1921. It was located at 508 Vine Street near the Future Fountain Square Plaza. The single screen theater sat around 1,400 viewers. And it was closed in the late 1950s, and the building was briefly converted to a retail store before being demolished. If you see, a lot of times you'll see photos of this block, stretch of blocks on Vine Street, and the Lyric marquee is very prominent from this time period. The Capitol Theater, to the right, it opened in 1921 at 7th and Vine downtown, and it later became a Cinerama Theater. Is anybody remembering this? <laughs> what was like a really exciting technology at the time. Advertising itself as the only venue for 300 miles with a three projector technology and a wide curved screen that gave audiences an immersive viewing experience, no glasses required. It was a big deal. The opening night in 1954 boasted state dignitaries from the tri-state area. And the Capitol Cinerama had 14 showings each week with prices ranging from $1.20 to $2.65. And the show went on until 1967 when the theater closed and it was torn all the way down in 1970. So this is one of the ones that kind of bridged um, it fully into the mid-century and a lot of people sitting here today might have attended this very theater. Another theater from kind of a different age was the Schubert. And I even found um, an old playbill from 1922-23 there with just some of the best part. It was set in the city's original YMCA, which was built in the 1840s. Schubert Theater was located on East 7th Street downtown, where, uh, very near where the Arnoff Center for the Arts sits today. So that's kind of always been an arts and entertainment district in Cincinnati. Opening in 1921, Schubert added a theater screen in the 1930s, and it was operated by Schubert Brothers Theater Company, which is now called the Schubert Organization, and still owns theaters all over the country. Schubert staged films and theater productions well into the 1970s before its closure in 1975. The building was demolished a year later. So this is kind of a, a pattern, you know, the uh, theater stages opening up in the 1920s or maybe even a few years earlier with a vaudeville program or a stage, stage act program converting to a screen theater when the technology became available, proceeding with that for the next couple decades and then kind of as Cincinnati's, downtown Cincinnati's population sort of declined um, they, they, this one after another just kind of closed. So this is this represents not just the loss of a stable building, but really the loss of kind of a downtown theater culture that Cincinnati used to have. <coughs> so accompanying our downtown theater culture, and this would have been a few, maybe a generation earlier than all of that. This is very much turn of the century. The uh, Strobridge Lithography Company. What started as a humble stationery store before the Civil War expanded to a full-scale lithography company producing some of the most vivid media and advertising images in the late 19th century and early 20th century Cincinnati. If it was worth seeing, Strobridge Lithographing Company promoted it, creating posters, advertising everything from stage shows to circus acts. The factory, built in 1884, was situated in over the Rhine along the Miami and Erie Canal um, and we certainly have made use of the canal for um, kind of freight moving. That's primarily why places would have been located along the canal. This is my first 
personal favorite?
vaudeville audience that was gaining popularity in the U.S. cities. Um, Empress Theater, by the way, is was uh, one of the original homes of Empress Chili. Um, they were they kind of had this captive audience there, just like hungry guys, and they're just like, <laughs> this is great. We'll just give them chili. It worked. <coughs> Gaiety hosted national burlesque acts in its heyday, but by 1970, with its best years behind it, the club had to come to the momentum of downtown development. It was demolished, eventually making way for an expanded main library. And my favorite factoid about this is that if you, if you now cross the breezeway from the library, you will be in the Children's Library, which used to be <laughs> sort of next to the main library. I just want to thank you for joining me and for taking a look at what I pulled together for you. This was such a fun project and I'm really happy to share it with you. I want to open the floor to any questions, comments, concerns, challenges. Yes. How did you start? How did I start? Like, were you like, gee, what about libraries? What about burlesque places? I mean, that was the hardest part of the whole thing. Did it just kind of lead to one thing to another? Yeah. The thing that I was most intimidated by, and I remember this from my magazine years, coming up with the original list is the hardest part, right? Once you have the list, then you have your marching orders, and you can go do your research. But not only coming up with it and making sure that it was a broad enough scope to do justice to our very interesting city, um, but that it kind of went back far enough. I struggled, I talked to my editor about how far back do I need to go? Do I need to stay in living memory? Or can I go back and talk about, say, the Catawba wine vineyards, which were Civil War adjacent, but kind of a cool part of our DNA as a city. Um, that was the Nicholas Longworth vineyard on Eden, pa Eden Park Hill. And um, so I kind of, they said, they kind of said, do whatever you want. So I, they didn't actually care. So I um, tried to find a good mix of places that people in this room maybe would remember or remember their parents talking about. I, like, I thought about my own grandparents and the kinds of places that they would have gone. They were born and raised in Cincinnati. They got married in 1951 and uh, lived in Sharonville their whole lives. And I, I thought about what would my grandma have liked to have read. Um, so I kind of did that, and then I, I snuck a sneaky picture of myself in there from some places. There's a little hidden picture of me in there um, from some places from my childhood. But for most of the places, they're mid-century or earlier, turn of the century. Um, and that, that narrowed the playing field a little bit, because once you kind of decide on a time frame, then you've got an, a finite number of places that you're going to cover. Oh, the zoo? Yeah, sorry, don't look that up. I didn't, I didn't know there was a zoo. Page 55, anyways, rolling around. I'm sorry, I don't know these factoids off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Which brings me to my second point about research which is that you only say what you know. Um, I, you just don't write things you're not sure about. And I, I, well, I could not get a definitive de could, uh, date for that, um, so I left it out. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I don't know. Absolutely, and yeah, this book is just a, a snapshot in time because unfortunately things continue to be uh, removed and demolished and I think uh, property developers don't really have a clear sense of the permanence of demolition and um, you know, we can, all, we can all look at this very easily and say, ah, oh, that's too bad, but not everybody thinks that way, so I totally agree. Yeah. Could you please mention the meat clock? Oh, sure, I forgot. Oh, how could I forget the meat clock? It was 
Who knows what he's talking about? Cons meat clock? Does anyone remember the cons meat clock? They're looking at us like we're crazy. <laughs> I can't pull up the picture, but I highly suggest that you Google this. Maybe not at work. <laughs> the cons meat clock. You gotta have a gimmick. Cincinnati's Porkopolis status had diminished somewhat by the time cons dubbed itself, and they quote, the wiener the world awaited. <laughs> but it was around this time after World War II that cons famous meat clock appeared at Fifth and Vine as the brand doubled down on its collective post-war appetites. Founded in 1883 by Elias Kahn, the company was instrumental in putting Cincinnati on the pork producing map. Kahn's was a hometown favorite for everything from barbecues to ball games. Kahn's was sold to Consolidated Foods Corporation, now Sara Lee, in 1966, and the original 17-acre Camp Washington processing plant was shut down in 2006, and the meat clock was lost to the sand of time. <laughs> it's somewhere. <laughs> It's in somebody's basement, I guess. <laughs> but it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a clock with meats as the numbers, like various meat products. And it was right downtown, like right on Fountain Square, like adjacent to Fountain Square. And it was there for like many years. And it's, it's really hilarious. And I just, I like, I like to imagine what kind of visitors thought of us when they saw that. But we were Porkopolis, for goodness sake. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's like what we are, sorry. Um, pigs used to run the streets, like that was for real. Uh, my favorite little story about uh, the pigs in Cincinnati is that um, Anthony Trollope, the author of Vanity Fair, his mother, Fanny, came to live, um, Fanny or Franny, I forget. Um, she came to live here and she was not impressed. And she didn't, she thought, I mean, Cincinnati was real dumb. And she would complain about all the pigs running through the streets. Um, it's just like, well, I mean, <laughs> Cincinnati. <laughs> um, but she, she just thought that we were it was such a bad water, and the pigs did not help. They probably smelled great. Probably smelled great. <laughs>